Welcome back to Capital City tonight. Good to see you in the Lord's house. And sorry it's a little warm, but uh, we're looking forward to having a great service. Let's have you stand, please. 231, follow on. Let's sing all three verses. 231. Down in the valley with my Savior I would go. singing to uh, number 60. Let's see. Sing, The Way of the Cross Leads Home. Page 60. for our offering tonight, please. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated.
beautiful. Thank you, Emma. Let's have you stand again, please. Page 89, Mansion Over the Hilltop. Let's sing that tonight. Page number 89, let's sing it out. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below. I love that song, Mansion Over the Hilltop. Let's uh, have you remain standing and pick up your Bibles for Pastor. Yeah, isn't that a great song? Looking forward to that day we get to heaven. And I got a lot more people on the other side than I used to have. And so heaven is a lot sweeter. I think the, more, the older you get, I think that takes place when you're young. I don't think you typically think about that. But I've been here a long time. We've seen a lot of people in our church through the years go to heaven. And we miss them, but we're going to see them once again. So that's a great song uh, to sing. Turn to, in your Bible tonight to Matthew chapter 5. Thank you for coming to church tonight. Matthew chapter, or Mark chapter 5. Did I say Matthew? Well, what can I say? I'm getting older. What, what do you mean? That wasn't, ki- that wasn't kind at all. <laughs> it's the truth. I know it's the truth. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. And verse number 25, I've been reading out of Matthew. So uh, verse number 25 through verse 34, we're going to uh, preach on another great word of the gospel tonight. Hope it'll be a, a help to you and an encouragement to you. Verse 25, And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. 
And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, and this would be an amazing situation, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing, but the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came, fell down before him, and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. Now Jesus knew who touched him. He did know that. But tonight I want to bring another great word of the gospel. It's the word faith tonight. The word faith. And we're going to look at it in particular. There's much to be said about faith. We're going to look tonight in uh, what we uh, know as saving faith. What it takes for a person to be saved. And we need to understand this. And uh, when we're dealing with people with the gospel and help them to understand what it means to be saved and make sure people really understand what salvation is. And faith is involved in a great way in salvation. So, but tonight we're going to deal with saving faith. And hope that will be a help to you and encouragement to you just to know that this is another great word of the gospel. And faith is in many different aspects, but we're going to deal with saving faith tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege to be able to be in church tonight. Thank you for these are people who have come back tonight. Thank you for the good services that we enjoyed today and your blessings upon the services. And Lord, I pray tonight you'll help us as we open up the word of God and discuss the subject of faith. And go throughout the Bible and see how individuals came to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is involved in saving faith. And so, Lord, help us to understand this when we're witnessing to people and helping them to come to salvation. And help them to realize what they need to do to be saved. That we ourselves understand what saving faith is. And so, Lord, thank you for our time to be together tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. The human race is divided into two classes of people, regardless of what the culture is saying. And, and we all know that really we're all of the same. We're of the human race. We know that. The Bible talks about that. But the human race is divided into two classes of people, believers and unbelievers. We know there are Jews and we know there are Gentiles. God's people are believers and they are characterized by this word faith. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 17, the just shall live by faith. Now, we're not going to talk about living faith tonight, but saving faith. But you could, you could deal with faith in many different aspects, but we're going to deal with it in the aspect of saving faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of fame of faith chapter, where it gives evidence of men and women uh, throughout the Bible who lived their lives by faith. And Hebrews eleven six 6 says, but without faith... It is impossible to please him. Faith is the operative principle of the new life. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And faith certainly is involved in our life of coming to know Christ as Savior and then living the Christian life. There are many aspects of faith that are found in Hebrews chapter 11. But in the study tonight, we will look at what is called saving faith. What is involved in saving faith? What must a person do to be saved. And the Bible tells us, gives us example after example after example of this wonderful passage, and we must know what is involved. And uh, my wife, for many years, she taught kindergarten at, at a Christian school, and then many years she taught children's ministry and taught women's ministry and was in me with the youth ministry and pastors. She's done a lot of different things. But even when she taught in a Christian school and she would uh, teach on the subject of heaven, hell, uh, she'd always have a bunch of kids raise their hand. No, no kid when they're five years old wants to go to hell. But they may not understand all that's involved. And she was very careful to make sure that kids would understand that because every time she would teach on that or give devotions in the classroom about that, every kid would raise their hand. But she wanted to make sure that they understood really what saving faith is. Over the years, we've tried to make sure that our Sunday school teachers and those who work with children, whether it be in vacation Bible school or in, in church when they come to church, that they understand what it means to have saving faith. I'll never forget a few years ago, we had a, a vacation Bible school. We had a, 
uh, it was a long, I think Brother Decker might have been here at that time, and he dressed up different things. He's a Western outfit one time, one time it was a space outfit. One time it's about those who are in emergency services, like firemen and police officers and things like that. And I think we had a firehouse out in the back that the kids could go through. It was a, a firehouse, a smokehouse. What you need to do if a fire breaks out in your house, and they told the kids to crawl on the floor and get below the floor. And that was a great tool and, and a great thing. And, and we had the firefighters here that night, and they brought their trucks and the sirens, and they brought their hoses, and they shot the hoses against the back of the building and stuff. And, and some of the kids wanted to, you know, it was warm, and some of the kids wanted to get wet, so they turned the nozzle down a little bit, and they kind of sprinkled the kids so they could get wet and everything. And I remember some kids got home, and I got a call. And I got a call from one of the parents, and they said, uh, I understand tonight that you baptized some of my children. I said, uh, what are you talking about? And we don't believe in sprinkling, but you know. But anyway, they, they, they said, I said, oh, no, 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 no. And the reason we would never do that, and we always made sure and people got saved, if we got kids to follow the Lord and believers baptism, we always talked to parents and make sure that it was okay with the parents for them to be baptized and maybe they come to church if they weren't saved and those things. But I'll never for, will forget that. I said, no, no, no. I said, the firefighters were here. They used their hose and they sprinkled the kids. And, but they were upset. And, and I guess rightfully so. They didn't know me. They didn't know the church. And, all, and uh, they calmed down after that. But I remember that. <laughs> you, you're baptizing my kids over there. And so, uh, no, that's not what we're doing. So that's not, saving faith is not getting sprinkled by the firefighters, okay? So we need to understand that. But what must a person do to be saved. Acts chapter 16 is a great passage of scripture on this. It's the, it talks about the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter uh, 16. And let's read in verse number 26. The Bible says, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his own sword, and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. And we've talked about that many times, that if the prisoners escaped under your watch, you, you were going to die. And so he was going to commit suicide because he knew he would be killed for the loss of prisoners. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out. And he said this, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So what is the human responsibility in the matter of salvation? We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. But take your Bible, first of all, and go to 1 John chapter 2 tonight. So at great cost, salvation came to us at great cost. And it cost the death of God's only Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. But 1 John chapter 2 is a great... Uh, a book in the Bible talks a lot about really what we talk about, eternal security and how you can know, have assurance of salvation. I preached on that many years ago. And there's about, I think there's about 20 evidences in uh, chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 that tell us the things that, we, that ought to take place in our lives to make sure that we're truly saved. And it's a great uh, passage of Scripture in a book on assurance of salvation. We're not do it, dealing with that tonight, although that's another great word of the gospel, is assurance and how we can have assurance of our salvation. But in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, the Bible says this, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Now that's a great, great big word, isn't it? It's a great big word, but it has great meaning to us tonight. And we need to understand the words of the Bible when reading the Bible. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not only but also for the sins of the whole world. And we're grateful that Jesus Christ died for the world. And we know that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's evidence after evidence after evidence of different individuals who came to a saving knowledge of Christ. But the word propitiation, this is a great word, and it means that the blood atonement of Christ, in other words, his death on the cross, appeased the wrath of God and satisfied his justice. When he looks at God's son and see that what he did in dying on the cross and his blood atonement, it appeased the wrath of God and satisfies his justice. If we, if we got what we deserved as justice, we'd be in hell. But thank God for mercy. 
And thank God for grace and mercy and grace. Those are great words of the gospel too. But thank God we didn't get what we deserved. So propitiation means the blood atonement of Christ appeased the wrath of God and satisfied his justice. Salvation is now offered to all men. Turn in, to your, in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45. And, and uh, it's hard to lead a, conserv- a conservative Jew to Christ out of the New Testament because they believe that Jesus was a great teacher. Many of them don't believe he was the son of God. But you can lead a Jew to Christ in the Old Testament. And so uh, the Bible talks about uh, some of these things, and you can use several passages. Isaiah 53 is a good passage. But you can lead a, a, a Jew to Christ out of the Old Testament. Then in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22, the Bible says, Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. And so salvation is offered to all men. Now, the human responsibility is involved is we, by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, we're going to talk about some of those things here in just a moment, but we know for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. But Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16 is a great passage of Scripture. The book of Romans is a great book to study doctrine, great teaching, instruction. And then, as we've said many times before, you get to chapter 12, and 12 through 16 talks about practical Christian living. So now that we're saved, now that we've been born again, now we've been justified, all the things that we learn in the book of Romans are to be put into practice in chapter 12 and verse 1. He says, I beseech you there, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. And then you're to begin to live out the Christian life, and God begins with those things in chapter 12 through 16. Chapter 16 is a... Uh, a chapter about many of the people that came to Christ. It's kind of a hall of fame of people, people who were saved, uh, perhaps in the Roman Empire, whatever, in the book of Romans. But there's a lot of individuals, many, many years ago, preached on that a long time ago. But in chapter uh, 16, it talks about those things and the people that came to know Christ. But in Romans chapter 1, in verse number 16, is a great verse. Paul said this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We ought never be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek or the Gentile. And so salvation came to all of us. So faith in Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, I believe, involves three basic steps that we'll look at here tonight according to the Word of God. Step one is a person must hear the Word of God. They must hear the Word of God. Turn to Romans chapter 10, a very familiar passage of Scripture. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I will never forget many years ago, a person came to me and said, I feel like I'm losing my faith. And I said, what do you mean by that? And went on to talk about it. They, they really weren't talking about losing their salvation. They just thought they just weren't where they need to be as a Christian life. And I said, well... Are you reading your Bible daily? Are you praying? Well, they weren't doing that very much. And their attendance had started to wane, which is just an outward sign that something's going on in your life. When you're not coming to church and you're not being involved in church the way you should be, there's already things taking place in your life that's got you to that place as a Christian where you once were faithful to all the services, and then maybe you start missing Wednesday night, then it's Sunday night, and pretty much it's all the time, or hit and miss all the time. And that's just something to, uh, that reveals to a person that there's things that are going on in your life that are moving you away from Christ. You've already begun to move away from the Word of God and the things of Christ, and that's just the outward sign is that you quit coming to church. That's one of the things. And that's why... You know, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 25, it says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, together as the manner of some is. There's always been a problem with church attendance. There's always been a problem with believers falling away. And the Bible goes on to tell us that we're to encourage and exhort one another. And so much the more you see the day approaching, the day approaching in that passage of Scripture is the return of Christ. So really, the darker it gets in this world, Christians ought to be flocking into the church. You remember 9-11? They were flocking in here. On a Wednesday night, the pa- it was packed. There wasn't a seat to be had in the church, and I preached on the world's greatest terrorist that night. 
and we had people getting saved through 9-11, all kinds of stuff, because people were afraid, and, and they were just afraid, and they wouldn't know what the Bible said, what God's Word said, and the church had to say. It didn't take about three or four weeks later, they began to start missing and dropping off again when things seemed to be settling down. And so I went on to tell this person many years ago, I said, well, the reason why you, you're not, your faith is not where it needs to be is because you're not reading the Bible like you should do, and you're not uh, praying, you've said that, and your, your, your church attendance is slipping. Because the Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, you're not reading your Bible, so you're not hearing from God. You're not coming to church, so you're not hearing from God. And so when we don't hear from God, and we, it doesn't bolster our faith, then we begin to lose our faith. We don't lose our salvation, but we begin to drift away from the Lord and not be where we're supposed to be. It's so important that you're here every time the doors are open, if humanly possible, to be in church so you can continue to hear, and hearing the Word of God will strengthen your faith. And in this church, we give you nothing but the Word of God. So the Word of God will increase your faith. And when you start missing and dropping out and missing services uh, for no apparent reason, other than you just don't want to be here, whatever the case would be, then your faith is going to wane. Uh, you don't lose your salvation, but you lose your ability to be where God wants you to be. So step one in the salvation process is that a person must hear. Before I can believe that Christ is able and willing to save me, I must hear that he is able and willing to do so. Now, take your Bible and go to John chapter 5 and verse number 24. John chapter 5 and verse number 24. And so the Bible says this. Very, these are the words of Jesus. Red letter edition. If you have a Bible that's marked that way. Verily, verily. And whenever you have two words together like that, you have Martha, Martha, yeah, verily, verily. That means sit up and pay attention because what's about to be said is of great importance. So verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come to condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. There was a man by the name of E. Stanley Jones who said this about faith. Faith is not merely you holding on to God. It is God holding on to you. And God has the ability to hold on to us. So step one is that you must hear. That's why it's so important to get people to church. That's why it's so important to get people under the sound of the gospel or to witness to them or pass out a track. And as they read the word of God, even in motel rooms, you've heard the story before, those Gideon Bibles that are in the motel rooms. And, and uh, last several years has been kind of a, uh, they've tried to take some of that out of places and take the Bible out and things like that. But we've all heard the example and testimonies of people who got saved in a motel room who was getting ready to maybe commit suicide. And they opened the door. There was a Bible. They started reading the Bible. And through reading the Bible, the Word of God convicted them. They got saved. They came to Christ. And they didn't take their life. And they're Christians serving God today. And so it's so important that we hear the Word of God. Reading the Word of God has the power and the ability uh, to help us understand what it means to be saved, but you must hear the gospel. You, the gospel simply means the good news. The good, that's what the word gospel means, and the good news is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, and there's people at the front door out there looking in at me. So, And so uh, it, it's important that they hear the gospel, and that's so important. And so when they come to church... We always present the gospel. I present the gospel this morning because I never know for sure who's saved and who may not be saved. But it's important that a person hears. And once they hear, uh, then they can understand what it means to be saved. So saving faith, step one, it means that they must hear. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, step two in this faith Believing faith, and one of the great words of the gospel, we preached a few Sunday nights ago about conviction, and conviction is important. Then last Sunday night, we preached about repentance and the need for repentance. People need to repent of their sins. There must be repentance before their salvation. And so then this saving faith, it involves people hearing. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's step one. Step two is that they must believe what they have heard. So having heard who he is and what he is able to do for me, I must believe what I hear 
And the word believe there means I must be in agreement with God. I believe that he died for me. Turn back to Isaiah chapter 53 here tonight. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number 5. Psalm 53 is a great, uh, or not Psalm, but Isaiah 50, Psalm uh, 53 is a great study of, of things of God and so on. Great truth in that. But in verse number 5, uh, let, let's, let's go back to verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And Jesus was well acquainted with grief. And, he, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. And he was despised and we esteemed him not. Jesus had emotional sorrow. He had physical sorrow. He had physical, physical pain. He was, all, he was 100% God. He was 100% man. So he was in all points tested like we are, tempted like we are, yet without sin. And so he does understand what you're going through. He does understand what I'm going through. And yet he was without sin. And so in verse 4 it says, Surely, and these are, these are talking about events that were to come in the future. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. The word transgressions means iniquities or sin. The great sacrifice that Jesus made for us is addressed here in this passage of Scripture. Surely or truly Christ bore our griefs. What does that mean? The word born there, it means to lift or to carry, to bear continuously. It means to forgive. He bore our griefs, which has the idea of physical and spiritual uh, difficulty and infirmities. I, sometimes when I preach on Easter, or not on Easter, but the Sunday before on, on uh, Palm Sunday, we sometimes preach about the cross. And sometimes over the years I've used an illustration of a physical uh, doctor and what he would account would happen to the human body through crucifixion and I read it and it's riveting and if you don't love Jesus and love what Christ has done for you as a Christian that illustration ought to make you fall in love with him because of what he did for you and what he did for us and he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free but he died alone for you and me and one of the most difficult things is when he looked up to heaven he said my God my God why hast thou forsaken me and God turned his back upon sin. So he certainly uh, bore uh, the infirmities of crucifixion and so on. Mankind is spiritually sick. They're spiritually sick. The problem is a sin problem. And that is what is addressed in this chapter, Isaiah 53. No matter who you are or who you think you are, we are all sinners in need of a Savior. And I love the song, Only a Sinner Saved by Grace. I love that song because that's who we are. And it doesn't matter how long you've been saved. Don't ever forget where you came from and where God brought you from and what he brought you out of. The Bible says he brought us up out of a horrible pit and set our feet on solid ground. And, and I love the song, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand, All Other Ground is Sinking Sand. And he did a work in my life as a young boy, and he saved me, and I've never forgotten that. Don't ever forget what God's done for you. The word wounded in that passage is a strong, intense word. It simply means to pollute oneself, to pierce, stain, to be slain. It describes a very painful, violent death. Crucifixion was a slow, painful, violent death. Christ died for our sins, taking the sins of the entire world upon him. He was stained with his own blood for you and, and for me. As lashes cut into his back, as the nails pierced his hands and feet, and as the sword pierced into his side. But before a person can be saved, there must be the hearing. They must hear the good news. Then they must believe. And it's a great verse of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 25. I love this passage of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 7. In verse 25, and it says this, But this man, talking about Jesus, because he continueth, or I'm reading in verse number uh, 24, verse 25, Wherefore he, or Jesus, is able also to save them to the uttermost. And what that means is once a person gets saved, you are saved eternally. We believe in what we call eternal security. 
The word security is not in the Bible, but evidences of, assur- of assurance of salvation is all through the Bible. It's in the book of 1 John. It's in the Gospels, all those things. So we need to understand that saving faith involves a person hearing the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So they must hear the word of God. Then they must believe. And they must be- believe that he's able to save you. And this Bible says, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, which means uh, once and for all, one person at a time, completely and forever, that come unto God by him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for us. So the word uttermost means completely and forever. Not only did, uh, is God, uh, did he die on the cross, but God's son is willing and able to save you. And he's able to bring salvation to your life, but saving faith, a great word of the gospel, it must be involved that a person must hear the word of God. Then they must believe, and he is able to save you, and he's able to save you to the uttermost and completely and forever, and he's willing to do that. Isn't that a wonderful blessing that he was willing to save me? In all my wretchedness and all my sinfulness, on that cross, he died in my place. And as I said this morning, as a teenager, I used to sing in our church, uh, I should have been crucified, but Jesus, God's son, took my place. I don't ever want to forget that. I don't want to think that I'm better than everybody else and I'm bigger than... No, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. But we must, in this saving faith, we must, have, we must hear it, then we must believe it. I must believe that he wants to save me. In John chapter 5, John chapter 5. And this is great truth in John chapter 5 and verse number 40. And these are great words of the gospel. And you may be saved tonight and you think, I I know about that. But you need to understand what's involved in saving faith. So when you witness to someone, you help them to understand this and make sure that when they understand that they're a sinner and Christ died for them, died on the cross and rose again, they repented of their sins, that you take them to saving faith. And even the fact that God loved you so much that he was able and willing to die for them. I don't know many people take people to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. We go through Romans, and that's fine. But there's so many other verses of Scripture that just point out that he loved us and he cared for us. And he has saving faith for us. So John chapter 5 and verse number 40 says this. Verse 39. Search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that you might have life. I must believe that he wants to save me. Men do not will to come to Christ. People choose to reject Christ as savior. But he died for mankind. What could solve America's problems tonight? And people getting saved by the multitudes. There were great revivals in this country, even in New York City years ago. They shut down the city and hours and hours, people streaming into praying and praying and praying. And great preaching revivals and people got saved. And God's still able to do that again. But what would save America today is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he could change our culture and he could change all the hatred and all the animosity and all the bitterness. And a lot of that just goes back to rejection of Christ. And you know what's going to happen? I think one of these days we live long enough, we're going to be the ones that are in the way. Christians. They're going to say it's you Christians out there. And that's said around the world already. And there's whispers of it sometimes in our country. And, you know, we're not the ones, hopefully not causing all the ruckus. It's those who don't know Christ as Savior. The greatest asset to any civilization ought to be Christians. We ought to have a peace of God in our life and and want to follow the the rule of law and, and all those kinds of things. And we know that God's not the author of confusion, but we know who is. I mean, so many people today in our society are confused because they don't know the Lord. And so saving faith involves hearing the gospel. It involves believing the gospel. And step three, there must be a trust. I hear, I believe, but now I must trust. And let's look at some examples which illustrate this saving faith. And we read about here in in, in the start of our message tonight in Mark chapter 5. And uh, it talks about this woman 
who had an issue of blood. And the Bible says in verse 27 that the woman heard. She heard the message. The Bible tells us that in verse 28, she came because she believed what she had heard and she knew that if she could only get to Jesus, that Jesus was able to heal her. And she knew that even if she could just touch his garment, that he could save her. So she heard about Jesus. She believed what she heard. And then she touched or trusted him in verses 27 and 28. And Jesus records, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. So saving faith involves hearing. Saving faith involves believing. Saving faith be, be, involves trusting in Christ. Turn to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Let's look at another example of this as it's illustrated in the Bible. So I'm not making these things up tonight. They're illustrated in the Bible and back, backed up by the authority of God's word. And so in Acts chapter 8 verses 29 through 37, uh, we have the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. And let's look in verse 26 and read there. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch, of great authority under Candace, queen of the Egyptians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Now, this guy was a, a sharp guy. He's in charge of all of the treasury for the queen, and he came up to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot. And the Bible says he read Isaiah the prophet. And then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. Now the principle of that is that the Holy Spirit still works in our lives today. And when the Holy Spirit speaks to you about witnessing to someone or talking to somebody or whatever you must do, make sure you, you do what God says. And so he joined him, he came and he joined thyself to his chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I accept some man should guide me? In other words, no, I don't understand. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him, and the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the prophet? That's talking about Jesus Christ. It's talking about a future uh, uh, crucifixion and so on of some other man. And Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Now, a principle on that is we need to know the word of God. Because when someone asks us a question about the word of God, or if they ask us how to be saved or witnessing to someone, we ought to be able to take them from where they are and bring them to where they need to be, that they hear the word of God, that they believe the word of God, they trust the word of God, and they know that saving faith is available. God is able to save whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. We looked at that in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. And the truths of that passage are evident. And so here's this man, a, a very powerful man, a, a man who was searching for the truth. And in verses 30 through 35, he heard about Christ. And in verse 35, it says he preached unto him Jesus. And he believed on him in verse number 37. And he trusted him his own saved, verse 37. And he got saved. I really believe today the battle in our country, it's a spiritual warfare. I believe it's God and Satan. And he's stirring up people and causing them to believe lies and all those type of things because he wants to damn their souls to an eternal hell. And the Christians are over here who we are, we are still supposed to be the salt and the light of this earth. And there's a conflict. And we're to bring the salvation to a lost world one by one. And try to see them transformed by the saving gospel uh, the same way that we were. And so the same saving faith. We heard it, we believed it, then we trusted Christ as our Savior. And the uh, Philippian jailer is also a person that did that as well in Acts chapter 16. The jailer took these three steps as well. He must have heard in order to ask in verse 30 of Acts 16. Then he believed in his immediate confession by baptism and his changed life proved that he trusted Christ to save him in verses 31 through 34. So what it means to believe on him. What does it mean? It, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is to accept him 
as God's gift. He came into his own Jewish people. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. John chapter 1, verse 12, and so on. So there must be a belief. Turn to John chapter 6. This is a great verse of scripture. John chapter 6 and verse number 37. And one of the great words of the gospel is saving faith. It's saving faith and it's faith. And we're looking at the aspect of saving faith tonight. So John chapter 6 and verse number 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Aren't you glad that when you came, he didn't say, you don't have enough money. Then he said, well, you're not the right color. I've heard people that are Christians that are prejudiced that don't believe certain people can be saved. Or they're, they're, they're so prejudiced they won't take the gospel to them. You ought to thank God somebody brought to you. We're just sinners saved by grace, and, and we all, we, you know, we're all of the human race. Let's not fall into the lies and, and all the things that we're hearing in our culture today that's pitting this group against this group, and this group against this group, and these people against... That's, that's all a lie to cause confusion and chaos. He died for the world, and we're all of one race. We're all the human race. Let's look beyond the colors. Let's look beyond all that stuff. Let's look beyond the lies and believe the truth of God's word. If you're not careful, and I've said for many years, I believe people be, believe a lie quicker than they believe the truth. Because I've been preaching the truth for a long time. There's a lot more p- people believe in lies than believe the truth. <laughs> but the truth is that God died for you and he wants to save you. So you must believe on Jesus Christ. It means to accept him as, as God's gift and he is the gift of salvation. This time, sometimes I preach on the greatest gift that was ever given. The gift of God's Son. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is to come unto him. Matthew chapter 11 and verse number 28. Come unto me all ye that are weary or heavy laden and I will give you rest. I'm so grateful that as a little boy I came and knocked on the screen door. I can, I can see it vividly tonight as I did so many years ago. And my mom was inside. I've told this story many times. And I said, Mom, I want to be saved. And she said, you can't come in. She thought I wanted to come in. She thought I said, play. I said, I want to be saved. And when she understood what it is, she opened the screen door and took the Bible. And thereby, on a couch on Troy Avenue here in Indianapolis, I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart and save me. I had no idea where God would take me. I had no idea what God would do in my life. I had no idea of the opportunities he would give set before me. It blows my mind how God has used me over the years and the places I've been able to go and to preach and things I would never have thought I could be able to do. I've told you a story about my speech problems and all that, but God cleared that up a long time ago because he wanted to use me, and that day I got saved. So to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is to accept him as God's gift. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you must come unto him. You must come into him. And all that the Father gives me shall come to me, and in him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. And God has no favorites. He died for all. And then to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is to call upon him for salvation. Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Some of the great words of the gospel is the word conviction that we preached on a couple weeks ago. Some of the great words of the gospel is the word repentance. And you don't hear much about that much anymore. But there must be repentance. And then one of the great words of the gospel tonight is that the word of faith, and we're dealing with it in the aspect of saving faith. There's all other kinds of faith that are mentioned in the scripture. Let's see, go to Luke chapter 23 tonight. We're almost finished, but Luke chapter 23. It's a great passage of scripture. Luke chapter 23. For many years, I always wondered on... Why there were three crosses. I said, well, you never wonder about that. I understand, but I think different than you probably think. And I always wondered why was there three crosses. And then God gave me a message many years ago, and I preached it here, on why the three crosses. And it was a great blessing and encouragement to me and 
to understand it. Maybe you're smarter than me tonight. Maybe you knew that a long time before I knew it, and that's great. But I came to the realization, and, and it was so powerful when, when I realized the three crosses and what they represented and through the scriptures, and we preached on that many years ago. But Luke chapter 23 talks about one of the thieves that was on the cross. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 23, and verse number 42, it says, talks about, uh, and let's look at verse 39. And one of the male factors which were uh, hanged railed on him. That means there was bu- verbal abuse, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And verse 41 says this, And we indeed justly. What was he saying? We deserve the punishment. We deserve to be here. We have done things against society, and we should have been sentenced to death. But this man did nothing wrong. For we received the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now those people who believe that you must be baptized to be saved, he didn't have time to come down. He's dying, wasn't he? Baptism is the first step of obedience. We understand that. But it's not essential for your salvation. It's the first step of obedience, and you ought to after you've been saved. People believe in baptismal regeneration. That's not true, not according to what the Bible says. How the publican did it in Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verses 13 and 14. The Bible says in verse 13 and 14, and the publican... And the publican was a tax collector in that day. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Bible says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. And the Pharisee went a great pomp and circumstance, so to speak, in the preceding verse, and look at me and what I've done, how wonderful I am. And the uh, publican just said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's why life, only a sinner saved by grace. Because we're all just sinners. We're all just sinners. And we see how the leper did it in Luke chapter 5. So we're just going through the Bible and seeing what the Bible says that saving faith is. Luke chapter 5, uh, verses 12 through 13. The Bible says this, And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And he put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy uh, departed from him. And he charged him to tell no man, but go show thyself the priest and offer for cleansing and so on and so forth, the Bible says. Then it talks about how the Gentile woman did it in Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. And it's good to just go through the Bible and see what people did to come to know Christ as their Savior and how they experience the saving faith that the Bible talks about. So Matthew chapter 15 and verse number 22. And the Bible says this in verse 22. And behold, a woman of, of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth. After us, in verse 28, then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thy will. What Jesus was saying, I've seen, you have great saving faith. Saving faith involves you must hear the gospel. You must believe the gospel. Then you must trust the gospel. And that is what's involved in saving faith. Great words of the gospel. Faith, in this aspect of saving faith, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is to rely only upon him for salvation. Do you believe like that? And the Bible says you're saved. And aren't you grateful tonight that one of the great words of the gospel is saving faith? And it goes out to whoever you want to take it to. Many years ago, we had visitation in our church, and we 
had people knock on doors and we had people make visits and things like that. And I said, if you, if the person you're at home is not home, leave a track, leave a note, but then go to the left and go to the right and put a gospel track or knock on that door because you can't take the gospel to the wrong address. And saving faith would change our culture and would change our country. And Jesus did it in his day, and we can still do it in our day. One of the great words of the gospel is conviction, is repentance, and it's faith. And I trust that you'll believe these things based upon what the word of God says and what's involved when a person comes to saving faith in Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege to be here tonight. Thank you for our time to be together, Lord, in the Lord's house tonight. And we pray, Lord, that you help us to understand the truths of the gospel and the truths of these messages that we're bringing on Sunday night, great words of the gospel. And Lord, I pray you'll help us to believe these things and to understand these things and to take the gospel into our communities and to see people come to a saving knowledge of Christ the way that many of us here tonight were saved in maybe the same fashion. To take a track or to invite someone to church or witness to people. But help us to truly understand what saving faith is, that people must hear. They must hear the gospel. They must believe it. And then they must trust the one who is able to give it. So, Lord, help us to do our part to get people to church, to hear the gospel, and do our part in our communities to see people come to salvation through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen.